and I think this will be hopefully this will be an interesting uh, interesting discussion. Um, some information that will be really helpful for you. Um, one of the things that we really want to make sure we're doing is is providing some some functional information. Um, but we're glad that you're here. Uh, this is one of our webinar series, um, and so if there are any questions, uh, feel free to uh, jump in, interrupt, put anything into the chat, um, and um, and we'll we'll go from there. We get to the next slide here. There we go. Um, MHA has been around for about 20 years. Some of you may be familiar with us, um, but uh, we do focus on the business continuity and uh, disaster recovery side of consulting and um, services. Um, but uh, really what we want to be able to do is make sure that organizations are able to um, really continue to function on their with their critical processes. And really we become a partner um, with a lot of our, our clients and, and look at that from a long-term perspective. We do have some tools in place um, that help with BIAs, um, with uh, developing of plans, and also looking at the maturity of a program. Um, so if there's anything there you'd like to look at, please go to our either our MHA Consulting um, website, which is mha-it.com, or bcmmetrics.com um, for any of that. But we have been around for quite a while, and really the, um, the consultants that we have are all well experienced and uh, have been around for, most of us have been around for about 20 plus years. One of the things that we think is very important um, to our organization is uh, the number of clients that we have. I mean, it's very unique. Um, but really, we don't focus on just one uh, industry or one vertical, but you can see it goes across uh, multiples from uh, education to healthcare to finance, um, consumer, travel, you know, really across the board. Um, quite, you know, just as, as information lately, we've been doing a lot of um, healthcare um, work with a lot of the, the uh, cyber uh, concerns going on with healthcare, but also um, that's been a big focus for a lot of those areas. We've been doing a lot of work there, but still across many, many organizations. Um, and we're very grateful um, for the work that, that we've been able to do with our various clients, and we appreciate that opportunity to partner with them. All right, so so today's today's session um, is a little bit different. Um, you know, maybe not, but I think it's a little bit different. Not something that we often talk about. Um, and what so really the focus today we really want to look at is what how can an organization start being functional quickly rather than looking at taking months and years to get a perfect program in place, um, but making sure that there's some level of capability in place as quickly as possible versus wanting to have a perfect or, or completely comprehensive program. That's the ultimate goal. Programs should be comprehensive. They should be mature. They should be out there. But if it takes two, three, four years before you're really functional, it's become a, the program has become the most important thing versus the organization being prepared. And, and I really like these, these proverbs that, that come out, right? Perfect is the enemy of good, you know, or in terms of planning, the enemy of a good plan um, is the dream of a perfect plan. And then sometimes we just get into analysis paralysis. You know, we, we really can look at what we have. So we're going to talk a little bit about those type of things. What do you need to do um, in order to ensure that you have something? And I think the title of this session is really important. 70% is better than 0%. And as we go to a, a lot of clients and they, they look at things, they want to focus on getting the program in place and getting all of the structure. And again, really important, and we're never going to argue that, and we recommend that. But in parallel to that, we want to make sure that we're looking at and how do we prepare um, so that we're there. So that's really the intent of today. And as I mentioned, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to take yourself off mute, jump in and ask a question, you know, or you can put it in the chat. And um, uh, Cassandra, who's part of our uh, organization, will be monitoring that and will interrupt me and and ask those questions as well, as well as at the end, um, there should be some time for questions and, and answers as well. So um, I'm sure all of you are very aware of the overall components that are part of business continuity. Um, and you can see them all here, don't necessarily need to read all of them. Um, but obviously when we think in terms of emergency management, what happens at the, at the start of an event, or if there's an, a situation where there's a safety issue, that's very vital and, and important to keep people and, you, and the facilities and equipment safe. And then there's crisis management. How do, we, how do we handle an overall event 
management level to ensure that the appropriate strategies and actions and communications at the high level are going on and ensuring that those who are executing business continuity plans or disaster recovery have everything that they need to to do that. And then the rest of it from a business continuity perspective to a technology, ITDR. And then we think in terms of people, single points of failure, the supply chain or services, think of that as third parties that are out there. So I'm going to kind of tip my hand right at the very beginning because this is what this, this is all about. When we talk about what do you need to have a minimally functional program, what I would say is you need to have something in place for all of these. You can't necessarily look at it and say, well, I'm just going to focus on the left-hand side of the screen and make sure that I have my emergency management plans and my crisis management and some business continuity plans or some disaster recovery, but I haven't really thought about the supply chain or third parties, or have I even looked at single points of failure in people? Now, so there needs to be some level of work that's gone into all of these areas, as opposed to checking them off the box. And it turns out that three years from now, we haven't even looked at the supply chain when in reality, or the third parties, when in reality, they're very, very important. So we'll talk about all of that, but that's really the message here is, you need to have some level of preparedness across everything in your organization um, in, in case there is some type of event so that you're not having to do something at an ad hoc basis. So some of the things just to kind of consider, there's a difference between recovery and resiliency. And so when you're thinking about how do I make sure I'm prepared, often resiliency is a longer term, harder, more expensive solution to put in place versus recovery, right? Recovery is there's an outage, right? That could be technology, it could be processes, um, it could be something. It may have some level of high availability where things automatically fail over, whether it be from a process perspective or a technology perspective. But typically recovery is going to be, it goes down, we now have actions that we take to get things up. And as we're all very aware from a business continuity perspective and even an ITDR, there are certain things that we determine we can recover them. If they're down for a few days, that's okay. Um, but then there are those that can't be. But as you're getting started, the most appropriate thing is can you recover in some form or fashion? So don't let the resiliency and I have to have this up immediately get in the way of having something in place. Being able to recover in even if it's 24 hours for something that has to be up quickly is better than not having it. And one of the things that, that we often will, will share with folks when we're doing BIAs and, and um, business, business plans, especially the BIAs when we're talking about recovery um, strategies and recovery timeframes, when we turn around and say, this is a process that's an RTO one that maybe needs to be up in four or eight hours or even less, and then we have the 24s and maybe the, the 72s and five days and more than five days. When we look in those in the hours, you know, we'll, we'll ask people, it's like, so you need to be up in four hours. We understand that's a requirement. Well, what happens if it was six? And most people would go, I'd be thrilled. Or if it's 24 hours and it goes from 24 to 36, that's good enough. So when you think about that, kind of look at those things that, yeah, we want them to be up and functioning in those timeframes from a BIA perspective. But there's very few processes and even applications that if you miss those by a couple hours either way, that it's going to be a major impact. Now, there are certain ones, right? When we start getting into healthcare and things like that, obviously, you can't not treat a patient. Um, so those have got to be addressed from manual processes. But as you're looking at, at, at what you need to do and where you're at today, keep in mind, resiliency is a great goal and it probably needs to be in place from a very mature perspective. But just being able to recover, even if it's a minimally capable situation or it takes longer than you desire, is still better than not having it. Um, we have, I work with organizations and at times they'll have, from a technology perspective, they'll have very good um, replication in place um, for their, you know, their top five applications or their top 10 applications. But then when we start looking at what can they do from a recovery perspective from their backups and everything else, it's really not sufficient. And so we go back and we'll say, you're not recoverable. That's a bad place to be. At least if you're recoverable, you know you can keep things working. So another important thing when you're looking at what do you want to make sure is taken care of and in place, really look at those risks. You know, what are the human risks? And, and in that, is there intentional um, uh, are people not following their processes? They're intentionally taking shortcuts. 
um, that's out there, even though the, the procedures and the, and the policies are in place to do it. And that's adding risk. Um, human error, you know, that we can't fix. People are going to make errors. That's just the, the nature of our condition. And that's, to me, the beauty of being a human. We make mistakes. We have all these differing uh, skill sets. But in the end, that's going to happen. So what does, what does that mean? What's the risk? What do we need to put in place? What's, what's the impact if there is human error um, out there? And is that something that needs to be focused? Um, unintentional physical errors that goes with human errors or cognitive issues. Data breaches and ransomware, right? That's a huge risk today. So, you know, if you're going to start looking at prioritizing, um, that's one area that should be a priority today. And then it'll go into some of the things that we talk about. Brand image, reputational damage, you know, what, what could happen, right? Look at some of the things that we've been seeing lately that, you know, it's very quick to, to have your image um, ruined if, uh, if something bad happens. And then technology outages. How dependent are you on technology? And if you are, what happens if that does go down? And what's the impact to your customers, to, uh, to the staff? Can they manually have, have things in place? And this is one area that I would just, again, kind of stay up front. If you don't have manual procedures for your technology outages, you're probably not prepared. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have completely comprehensive and everything in place, but you should know, and, or, and the various departments should know, how do I act if I don't have my technology? You know, a lot of times when we do BIAs, people will say, I'm just going to wait until the technology comes up. It's like, great, that's wonderful if it's a couple of hours, but what happens if it's a day? What happens if there's a major data breach and you have to take things down and it's going to be one, two, three days? Can you still do anything or are you literally just sitting there waiting and, and you're, you're basically in shutdown? So one of the important things here is look at what your risks are, what's most likely to occur and then start looking at how do I mitigate, how do I ensure that I can deal if that risk occurs, whether it be manually or my steps are in place. Prioritization, as we just said, is key. But as you're looking at it, the life safety and of both people and the, um, uh, the facilities or your equipment should be the most important thing you look at. So in the end, if you don't have an emergency management response, evacuations, response to any kind of uh, violent event, training and information for people that, that they need to know what to do, the basic pieces need to be in place. You know, are you doing an annual evacuation um, exercise? Or do people know, is there, a, is there a, an ongoing training of this is what happens in these type of events? Even if people just know, right? If we think about a, a violent event response, for example, constant or, or frequent reminders of if this happens, this is how this is how you behave. You run, you fight. This is how you um, you will barricade yourself in a room or get out the door. Even if it's just those few basic um, concepts and instructions, that's better than waiting for, hey, I've got this full training program. And we're going to go through the whole plan. At least letting people know those basics is key. That's the message today. There needs to be basic information and basic um, pieces in place for all of these different areas. Incident stabilization, emergency management, crisis management. Is there a team in place? Is there an emergency management team that's in, that exists that know how to execute the life safety measures? Is there a crisis management team at the corporate level that at least they know we will get together, this is where we're going to be, and we're going to manage the event from there? Right? Trying to take a lot of these steps that are often not defined and get them defined. It's, it's relatively easy and it can be done relatively quickly without trying to do a full a full blown plan. Property preservation and then restoration of the business. So as you think about your program and kind of think about it in those priorities is do you have any kind of life safety um, steps and plans in place? Yes, no. You do? Great. Then you look at the next one. Do we know what to do from a crisis or, or emergency management perspective at a general high level? Yes or no. If it doesn't exist, great. That's the next thing you need to go put something very basic in place. Property preservation or restoration of business. So as you kind of look at that, think about that from a priority perspective. Don't try to get it perfect, but try to have something in place before, you know, as you move to the next, uh, the next ones. But that would be the priority that you want. Again, when we look now at the functional resiliency requirements, this is kind of where we can 
really make a difference as we look at this. So you're going to see here, this is not priority, right? You're going to do the priority that we just talked about. But this is how you can start getting all of these things done quickly. This is the 70% versus the 100%. When we think in terms of, well, I'm not really sure what my true critical functions are to make sure that we have those plans in place first, right? Well, we, we always say, let's go do a BIA. And then if we do a full BIA, that's several months worth of work because we're having interviews. And we're doing all of this. You don't need to do that. You can go through and have very quick conversations and do a modified BIA. Sit down and understand what are your known current needs? What are sales? What are shipments? What are my people? What are those, what are those functions as you, as you talk to various departments in 30 minutes and say, tell me the top three things that you can't do um, that would impact our ability to serve our customers or shipments, right? You don't have to get into that full detail, um, but understand I've got to do these four things. Or you can sit down with, with the various groups and understand from a department level, this department needs to be available because of these four functions. Again, thinking in terms of 30 minutes, back of the envelope, just having a conversation. And in, and in many cases, senior executives can probably give that to you right off in a, in a 30 minute discussion. That's not perfect. And we're not suggesting that that's the way to do a BIA, but it's a place to get started. And then you can take the BIA as the next step. Same thing for a, a threat and risk assessment. Look at it from, from the various locations. What are the top five risks that could occur? Are, there, are they being mitigated? Um, what are the steps to mitigate them? Start sitting down with people and at least get that down on a piece of paper. Um, information technology. Rather than focusing on meeting an RTO on the top five applications, which again, very important. But if we start thinking about big picture, uh, I, you know, we work with organizations a lot and they've done the same disaster recovery exercises for the last five years. And it's been the, the three or four or five applications. They've never tested anything else. And when we start looking at it, they're like, but that's all we need to be recovered because that's the, the tier one application. And my question to them is, then you don't use anything else? And they're like, well, of course not. I mean, Actually, we get most of our calls on these applications. It's like, well, then those are still pretty important, even though in an in a event, they may not have to be recovered first, they're gonna have to be recovered or you can't function ultimately. So looking at it from the standpoint of looking at the big picture from a technology, do I have the appropriate data protection in place? Can I actually recover all of the applications and their dependencies, not just the critical apps? Because a lot of times those critical apps, while they're they're deemed critical, you can always use like the ERPs of the world. There's always hooks and there's always other things that people ultimately need that are key to keeping the organization running. So looking at that from that big picture, can I get everything up? Do I know what those dependencies are? That's actually probably more important than being able to just say, yeah, I can recover these five applications, but I really can't do the others because I, I don't have it in place. Third-party services, cloud dependencies key, key, key. We're becoming so much more dependent on those cloud services. And will I be able to access them? What happens if they go down? What's their capability? That's becoming more and more important. And then staff access, right? That, that, that whole idea of if an application is running, but nobody can get to it, is it really functional? Well, absolutely not. You have to be able to get to it. So is there enough um, remote access capability if, if it's going to be VPN? Is there enough um, capacity on those devices? Do people know how to do it? Because it's now a different um, URL to get to the applications or there's a different access method. Do people know how to do that? Great, application is up, but if they can't, you're spending a lot of time there. Again, you don't have to be perfect, but you have to have that and know where it's at. Vendors, third parties, you know, those products. Again, do you know who your critical vendors are? Do you know who your third party services? Who are those critical ones without which you can't? do anything or your customers will be severely impacted or there's a huge safety risk. What are those products they do? Do you have any single points of failure, right? I, you know, you're hearing me say a lot of different things and, and I hope that to a certain extent you feel a little bit overwhelmed, but that's not the intent. The intent is to look at this and again, not try to get everything in place, but understand what are those important pieces because all of these are important. You just don't have to do it to the full extent that we normally do and start missing it. So it's really doing everything, but not necessarily doing everything perfectly. And then 
it's just a single line, but it's at the bottom, and I probably should have put it at the top. People and training. That is the one aspect that we spend so much time looking at our program and doing our BIAs and talking with those people, putting in technology solutions. Right? And that tends to be a very small group of people that we talk to. And they feel pretty comfortable and they feel like they know what's doing and they help build the plans. But the rest of the organization has no idea. So figuring out how do you do basic and consistent training with the whole organization so they know what their role is and they know how to act in an event. Again, even if it's just four or five steps. And an example that I like to use there is in, in a recent engagement that we've had, we went out and we built uh, we build some um, activation lists and some um, continuity checklists and, and ready for people to execute in, a, in an event. And it was good and they did a really good job. We had a follow-up meeting um, uh, some follow-up several months later to go over the information and there was a few people on the call and, and we said hey you know you need to look at your plans again we're still at a high risk we want to make sure these are updated and there was probably three or four people on the call that went i have no idea what you're talking about i've never seen these documents this is the first time i've ever been told about it and we realized there was a gap in all of this great work that we spent months doing and yet probably a majority of I shouldn't say a majority, but a significant portion of the organization had no idea that this, these things even existed. That's a problem. Even though the documentation is there, nobody knows how to use it. So you kind of heard me already say this. Mature programs come after all of these basic capabilities exist, right? Do, do you have everything? So when we think about what do, what do you need to worry about? You as a business continuity um, professional, if you don't know what impacts your organization, go learn it, get that information so that you can help guide and understand this is where our focus needs to be because this is the most critical piece or these organizations, while important, um, they don't have anything in place. And oh my goodness, in certain situations, they need to be up and functioning even though they might not be in hours, they're in the first few days and they don't have anything there because we've been focusing on just those you know, criticals or those tier zero, tier one processes. So understand that. Um, so go out, learn, spend some time doing that. That's kind of why those modified BIAs and TRAs can be really helpful. You will learn about the business. You'll understand what's really important um, and understand it if you don't. Don't let your business continuity process get in the way of preparedness. And that's kind of what I was saying um, previously. Please do not focus so much on making sure your program is in place that it then limits your ability actually to get preparedness work done, right? We love to have, and it's important to have status meetings and let's let's share our dashboards and let's do all of that. But the reality is all dashboards do is tell people what you've done. But if you look at that and say, I've only got 30% of the departments with any kind of preparation, you're not even 70% ready, you're only 30% ready and what about the rest? But they're these really cool documents. So. Again, I'm not saying they're not important. I don't want to minimize it. I guess I'm trying to flip it to say being ready to go is a lot more important than sharing and spending a lot of time on documentation and process flows and all of that. It's necessary. We've got to get the buy-in from management. We're going to talk about that. So there's a balance. But please don't let the process get in the way of preparedness. Documentation is not about preparedness, as, as, I, as you've just heard me say. The ability to execute is much better than a document, right? That sits on some storage location or that you've had that nobody looks at, and nobody knows where it's at. Training and people knowing what to do, when to do it is much more important. Or from a technology perspective, making sure that the technology is in place to execute is much more important than saying, but this is what we would do. I see documents all the time that talk about, this is how we would recover. But the reality is, Half of what they say they're going to do isn't even in place. They would have to do it at event time. They would have to go purchase hardware. They'd have to configure. They'd have to do all of that when rather than spending that. And that's still important to understand if that's in the document. But spending that time and saying, now let's go off and fix all of this or let's adjust it, much, much more important. Um, focusing on remediating those critical gaps, hence that basic understanding of TRAs and BIAs. What is it that if is not in place is really going to cripple us? And let's make sure we have something there. 
Again, don't worry about it being perfect, but I've got something in place so that I'm ready to go. Third-party dependencies, we've talked about that. And this is just a question. Do BIAs and TRAs make you more prepared? They're important information, they're important data to help you get there, but I would argue as important as they are and as, as important as they help you understand what you're gonna to need to do, once you're done with a BIA and a TRA, that's just data. It hasn't fixed anything. And so go back to what I said before, process. Make sure that you know what your critical gaps are. As soon as you have that information, I would almost argue, rather than spending another six months doing a full BIA, go find those basic things and get spend the six months getting these basic things in place, then start stepping back and doing BIAs, TRAs, all of the documentation, all of those things, but make sure people are ready to go before you start really doing anything. Or in, in parallel to that, let me say in parallel as opposed to, as opposed to. People, again, I think we as MHA are coming around to people are literally the most important piece and the key to your functional preparedness. Do you have people who are single points of failure, a single skill set, knowledge um, that only they can do? Do you have any kind of, of documentation or have you done any kind of cross training so that those people don't exist? You know, it's it's not as it's not as um, frequent, but there are still cases where we will talk to people and say, oh, so-and-so is the one that does that. What happens when they go on vacation? Either it just waits for them to come back or they actually work on it while they're on vacation because nobody else can do it. It's a scary place to be. If that person isn't there, of course you would figure it out. But why, why put yourselves in that, um, in that kind of risk? Training for people's role in resiliency. So as we, as we talked about that, this is, this is an important piece, and it doesn't have to be formal. It can be done at the, the group level, the department level, but it needs to be done, right? Um, I, I tend to recommend, you know, do this as part of team meetings, 10 minutes, five minutes in, you know, uh, a monthly team meeting or a quarterly team meeting where people sit down and talk about, this is what we would do as a team. This is how we would behave. Here's the plan, or here's our execution. Are there any risks? What do we know about? Do you know what you would do? What's your recovery? How do we prevent things? What about testing? Hey, let's just do a quick 15 minute exercise of, of how we would do this. What about access? Do you know how to get to everything? Let's make sure that works. Let's try it out right now. Let's just see if we can get to the, to the VPN and do you know how to do that, right? Just those small, quick um, pieces can be huge, right? Um, do, do those folks who are responsible for secondary responsibilities, right? Why not be their primary? Do they have access to all the tools? This is, is above and beyond just do they know access to systems, but do they know what applications they might need to get to? Do they know how to get to any documentation that you exist? It's here. This is where you go. It's a special, it's a special access that you haven't used before. And then any kind of resource constraints. What happens if you know, people are unavailable, if certain people are sick, back to the single points of failure, or if you have a significant department who is unavailable? Or, you know, can vendors provide some of that staff augmentation? Look at that up front. You might not have the perfect plan. You might not have all of the details, but you know, in case something happens, yeah, I can go to this vendor and they can help me, right? And it might just be a, a, a conversation that departments have. It's like, if this happens, are you capable um, to do it? And how quickly could you get somebody there? Great, I know. That's the extent of it. I'm better prepared now because I have a vendor if I have a, a resource need. Um, some of the other things there in the wheel that's on the right hand side. Um, what about family or dependent needs? You know, one of the things that we often talk about also from a people perspective is physical limitations. And what I mean by that, are there um, accommodations that people have at the, at the workplace that need to be addressed in terms of recovery, needs, right? Whether that's um, physical accommodations, right, for those that might have mobility issues um, or are there those who might have certain um, emotional needs as well, right? And is that a situation, and this is very sensitive, obviously, and we have to be very careful in terms of privacy and, and those things, but are there folks because of certain um, emotional needs that in a crisis, they need, we need to be prepared to help them in a certain way because maybe that's, you know, um, that's a trigger point, for example, or are there trigger points that, that uh, HR is aware of? They might not be able to share that generally, but those are important things, family needs, right? Is there something going on? Hey, this person has got, is the primary caregiver and if something goes wrong, they're gone. And they're gonna be taking care of their family. 
Um, the, uh, the public visibility of staff and leadership and um, all of those different things, you know, what is there, you know, sometimes, you know, being in the public eye can be a reputational issue, but also I would say, you know, public vis visibility is making sure that leadership also is con constantly, is ensuring that these resiliency concepts are out there and being done. Manual workarounds. Um, this is something I, I kind of mentioned before. Really something that we need to do a better job in today's world, which I think is ironic, I'm sure as I say that, where we say we become more and more dependent on technology. But because of that, when our technology goes down, we really are often um, incapacitated because we're like, I, I don't have a way to do this manually. When in reality, there are probably ways to do it. Not perfect, and it might be very difficult, but you can at least limp through, or at least you should consider it. Healthcare is a really good example of that, right? If certain technologies go down when you're in the hospital, patient care continues. It's not perfect, it's not nearly as efficient, but they have steps that they can continue to care for you. Right? In the same way for our organizations, what do we need to do? How can we manually handle these things, even if it's imperfect and it's just going to be barely us able to limp along? Payroll is a really good example for that, right? That should be planned up front. Don't just say, oh, we're just going to pay the last period. That may or may not be okay. There's a ton of implications to that, right? And I would argue pay is probably one of the most important things you do need to be prepared to do. These people need their money. People cannot, many people are living paycheck to paycheck, or they can't go a couple of weeks without getting paid, or they rely on, you know, what their standard is. And so understanding that is key. If you, if you have to do things manually back in the 70s, right? If you remember, if you watch some of the old movies and you have the, the mail, you know, you started in the mail room and you had people moving mail around. That's how they got things there because we didn't have our electronics. Similar types of things. Do you need runners? If technology goes down, you've got the departments maybe that aren't going to be up and functioning as quickly as they need to be. They become your runners. They become the old quote unquote mail staff. And they're the ones pushing papers around to those that need it because they can. They don't need to be up and, and performing their functions within the first few days. Um, you know, again, alternate shipping um, manufacturing ideas. Do you know how you can do that? I had a client that um, it was a snowstorm and they uh, this was a, a distribution location. And while the distribution could continue, the problem was the couriers and the carriers couldn't get to their building to pick up the shipments to then get out and get to the um, to either get onto the trucks going out or get onto the planes at the airport. So they had to come up very quickly with, okay, everybody with a four wheel drive, you've just become a courier, you're taking it down to FedEx or UPS, or you're taking it to the airport, because that was still going on. Thinking about those kind of creative ideas can be really important. What would you do, right? And having that at least understood up front, yeah, we can do that and that's what we would do. Um, vendor third party support, we've talked about that. Um, you know, protection of any kind of downtime devices, right? If you do have certain things, you're in a, a public safety or you're in a, 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 a safety or a, even a healthcare organization, they often will have downtime devices that we'd use in case technology goes down because they need to have some basic information to even do their manual steps. Are those protected? That needs to be in place well before necessarily having all of your documents in place, right? And then the implications to those manual process when Portions of the environment are up. Yeah, I start getting some applications up, and I do I still have to run certain things manually? How do I get the data back? You know, all of those things are considered. Again, I know this sounds like a lot, and again, my message here is not try to get it all perfect, but consider all of these things that are going to help you be partially prepared and ready to go. It's kind of an all needs to be there, not everything needs to be perfect. Right? Um, an important thing from a manual workaround, and this is really more about a cyber, but I think it's very important and it's, it's key to this minimal, minimally capable situation is make sure you document assumptions for services that are gonna remain up if you have some type of massive technology outage, right? There are gonna be those certain things that you do determine and you put in place to say, they have to be up. There is no manual workaround anymore. We can't do it. They just have to be there and then make sure they're in place, but document that it's probably very limited but make sure people understand. If we have a full technology outage, these are the three or four things that will be up, nothing else, don't plan on it, get your manual steps in place, right? And, and again, from a uh, cyber perspective, you need to start thinking about an idea of two or more weeks without technology. 
There are organizations who have been hit hard with ransomware. They've literally had to take their entire environment down and build it up from scratch, from network to servers, and then all the way up. It wasn't just, hey, we're flipping this over. Because of the situation of the cyber, they couldn't just use their normal DR procedures. It was literally building things up from backups. And so they were down for two weeks, sometimes even more. So they developed manual forms, creative thought, you know, what are their outside cloud services might be useful. Again, think about that. And then also kind of activation. When something like that happens, there's that, there's that piece of here's my recovery steps, but are there certain activation steps, meaning steps I have to take in order for me to actually perform these things? Manual, we're, it's funny, we, we, you know, when I started in this 20 plus years ago, there was a lot of manual steps. Then I got away from that because we said, well, we just have to get the technology up, make sure the technology works. We're now kind of circling back to where the situation is. We need these manual steps because we can't guarantee the technology will always be up in the way that we've designed it. Third parties. Um, do you understand your dependence on them? This would be something I would say again up front to get to that 70%. Do you know how dependent you are on vendors? What about your single source vendors that if they're not there or they're only they're the only one providing you a product or service? What is that? Make sure you have that, that inventory and you understand that. Um, and then identify, are there alternates that can help you for any kind of single points of failure, you know, plans are in place, et cetera. Um, and then make sure you have some level of remediation for those for those losses if necessary. Again, it can all of this could be three or four steps on a piece of paper, right? To start with, at least you've thought about it and you know that's the key. Then you can continue to refine. Management, um, really getting management key to any kind of functional resiliency is is key, right? And this is really more of an overall business continuity, but I think as you're going through and helping them understand um, is getting them you know, to understand what is the potential for an event, you know, or there's events going on. This is how this could impact us. We're at the same risk as this organization. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, that's happened a lot in healthcare these days where some of the cyber events that have happened to certain healthcare organizations, they're now sharing that. And they have many of them have realized we're at the same risk that those organizations that were hit by. We need to be better prepared. That's helped their management teams. Um, but also be very specific to your organization, right? Um, you know, if we lost X location due to a hurricane because it's highly likely and we can't continue to manufacture or ship this piece or um, wildfires in California and Arizona, if we use that example. So be very specific that then would help, right? Or we lost the data center, right? And oh, by the way, there is no generator um, or we're on a single substation. And so if that goes down, we, we've completely lost things. You know, we don't have enough hardware to recover, right? Being very specific with management to understand this is our actual risk. This is the state that we're in. And if, and if this happens, this is why we can't recover or this is the risk and this is the impact to that. Um, and that will then help you know, eliminate those gaps. Um, and I think often if you look at those, those critical needs, really focus it on business impact and then say, we're just gonna do the minimal amount needed to get us prepared to clear those gaps or needs is really going to help management become more bought in because it's a very tactical and clear response as opposed to high in the sky, do I really need all this insurance, quote unquote, a business continuity when you can look at it and say, here are our risks, these are the things that will make us more prepared, and it's a very high likely, or it's likely that can occur, and this is how we're gonna do it. We're not gonna spend six months doing it, we're gonna spend a month, for an example. So that's how I would you know, use your um, business continuity status meetings or updates with, um, with management to focus on those things up front. Once you're more mature, then you're gonna be looking at, here's our overall status, we've gotta get here, be more prepared. But this should still always be in your mind. What is it that is preventing us from being prepared? And let's make sure we focus on that. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about um, that um, is in here, and I'm going to come. I'm going to kind of come back to this functional resiliency of people, um, and that is oops, apologies um, is thinking about the training side and exercises. We are finding, and, and I have found, especially on the technology side, but also on the business continuity side, that 
tabletop exercises, more infrequent, shorter exercises are much better, um, more effective than these big half day, um, you know, we're going to mock through this. Ultimately, we want to try some things, but you can, you can get a lot out of these very small and quick trainings, like I mentioned. So from a technology perspective, make sure that you're, you're, you are doing some of those critical, those critical pieces, but sitting down and having a two hour mock exercise about um, the overall recovery, if you had to do the whole thing, what would you do, what would you find? Is actually very beneficial because people will find all of the pieces that they're missing. They don't focus on just a technology or focus on the exercise scope. Looking at it from that big picture will really demonstrate and will actually identify the gaps and issues that you really probably should go focus on versus just repeating the same thing over and over and saying, well, we've got this exercise and because we're gonna be trying to get people to work you know, remotely or we're gonna try to do this manually, we focus that exercise so far down to make sure that the exercise works that we lose sight of what are we really trying to accomplish? Does this really simulate a real event? And so sometimes those very quick or those tabletops will give you more of that information and get you off and be more prepared. So really be flexible within your exercises and your training. Um, but in the end, if, if I were going to have to choose in resource time between spending time on, and training people and sitting down, making sure they understood their roles, what they would do, do they know what to do, even if it's just them writing it down themselves or, or they're working through it in their head, I would actually probably spend more time with that than I would trying to get this really detailed document in place. Because I know if somebody can execute, we're going to be able to recover. But if somebody just picks up a piece of paper or a document that they've never seen and they're not really sure about, and it just has, you know, um, probably really good information, but something that somebody else wrote that they understood, but that, that the other folks didn't, it isn't going to be as useful. So please consider the people side of this and getting people trained, giving the um, encouragement to the department managers and supervisors to include resiliency and business continuity concepts for them. You know, um, we have done this with other clients where we've given them just a basic list of here are the concepts, here is kind of the structure that you want to go through and just send that out to the departments and make sure that they do that on a regular basis. Um, and then people are now really prepared because, as you know, as we as you all well know, when we exercise and when we go out and practice, that's when we be good, become good at something. It isn't that we pull out the document when we go out and run or we go out and do our exercises. We look at that and then we go out and try it. And then I don't need the document as much anymore. Um, the document is still important because I need to reference it, but I'm referencing it. I'm not using it to execute everything. The analogy that I like to use there was I still remember, you know, in college, um, you know, in a, uh, you know, it was a history class. I, I just still remember this where we're sitting there going through and the professor is, you know, doing his lecture and he goes through it. And about every 15 minutes, he'd look down at his notes and he would go, oh, let me go back and make sure that I do this. Right. Or, um, um, you know, or, or in it, he would reference his notes and say, yep, let me let me take a tangent off to here. He didn't need his notes to give the lecture. The notes were there to help him um, ensure that he was giving all of the right information and he didn't forget anything and didn't go too off far off a field. Same thing here. People need to know what to do. The documentation and the information should support them in doing. That's really everything I wanted to share. Again, not a whole lot of, you know. Here's, here's a specific execution. It's really for you to go off, look at what do you need to look at to ensure that you are more closely prepared and have the basics in place and have some minimally um, actions in place across all of the different areas, not just being able to say, I've got these two or three applications or these two or three business processes and they're rock solid. What about the rest of them? That's kind of what we're talking about in terms of 70% is better than 0%. All right. Um, well, we're really grateful for the, the time that you spent. I hope this has given you some things to think about um, and to go off in your own programs and consider how can I modify what I'm doing um, to make sure that we're more prepared. And again, the message you know, is don't try to make it perfect, but go find those things that are not in place and do some level of work, even if it's just a page of 
informational. And even if it's just a, hey, we want to do a 15 minute training in your um, your department meeting so that you understand what you would do. That is going to go a long way in your overall preparedness. Um, if you do have any questions at any point in time, please feel free to reach out to uh, myself. I'm always available by email. Um, we'll always, you know, happy to spend a few minutes um, on a phone call if you have a few questions. Um, you know, that's just something that we do as a service. So you're always welcome to reach out um, and I'd be happy to answer any of those questions. All right, well, we will end here. Have a great rest of your day. And, and again, thanks so much and good luck with all of your activities.